How's it going, man? Good. How are you? Thanks for having yeah. me on. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for coming, joining us, uh, and taking some of your time to uh, discuss about fly lines. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, how are you doing? The family? Good. Everyone's, yeah? Every, everyone's back in the plant after all this chaos, which is great, and uh, playing a little catch-up, but we're in really good shape, and uh, I mean, all things considered, we're, we're really lucky, and uh, man, everything's going smooth, business is good, and uh, we're, we couldn't be more happy. Fantastic. I was um, using some of your products on, it was last weekend, actually, was out on the river uh, trying some Golden Dorados. Just, there's a bunch of small ones where uh, nearby where I live in. And um, I was using the recent, uh, at least for me, it's recent, the Cortland Hives. Yep. My line. Yep. Such a great, such a great line. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, on the eight. That was fantastic. It was fantastic. Having a lot of fun with those. So uh, the topic of tonight, guys, is, is fly lines. And you guys can ask Brooks uh, your questions. I'm just going to post this and fix it in the comment section. And, um, well, of course, we're going to have this on Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Also, we're going to have the YouTube version of the whole conversation. I'm going to add it and post-produce it so we can put the translate. You guys can, from different languages, you guys can have access to this whole conversation with subtitles later on on YouTube. As well as going to put uh, one highlight of this conversation on Instagram as well. Okay. So, Brooks, let's do this. I'm ready. All right, buddy. Um, so can you give us a little bit of a feedback on your history with fly fishing or fishing and how did you jump into fly fishing? Who started you in this, this whole thing? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, so, so I live in Syracuse, New York, uh, upstate New York. We're about eh, four or five hours from New York city. Um, I grew up on a small lake in upstate New York, actually 10 minutes North of Cortland, uh, New York, where Cortland's factory is. Um, I was actually born in Cortland, New York, so I have a lot of history, and uh, I'm a hometown boy when it comes to Cortland line, but uh, yeah, I grew up on a small lake. I mean, yeah, I, I grew up spin fishing and, you know, really whatever kind of fishing that it was that I could get my hands on. Um, grew up doing uh, salmon, steelhead type stuff on the Lake Ontario tributaries, and I remember uh, I had a small fly box that my grandfather gave to me that... Uh, Someone at Cortland University uh, State College gave to my grandfather, and it's a bunch of old wet flies. I mean, to be honest, they were they were garbage at that point. Cause they were like 25 <laughs> years old. They were like all rotted out. But I was yeah. super cool. I mean, I, I used them on bluegill. Um, I had some crappy old fly rod that I'd whip around off the dock. Um, that's really how I started fly fishing. But uh, I probably got really into fly fishing you know in high school and college once I graduated from you know spin fishing and whatnot um just kind of like that challenge and, and and thought it was awesome and it's yeah. really it's it's really been crazy ever since so I mean yeah I'd say probably around you know maybe 20 years old I, I really started fly um met a lot of buddies in college that that were into fly fishing as well I learned a lot from them uh Taught a few guys that didn't know as much. I, you know, I was mediocre at, at best, you know, for a long time. Really, until I, uh, until I started working at Cortland. Um, a lot of fellow employees really brought me up to speed. And, man, I skipped the learning curve real quick when I started working there. So I've just been into it, you know, ever since. I'm, I'm you know, 33 years old now. So uh, I'd say, you know, for over a dozen years, I've just been a hardcore fly angler. Um, but yeah, I tell you what, working at Cortland, you get brought up to speed real quick on, uh, knots. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that. Tapers, what, what's what, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's been great and it's been a great ride as well. And to be amongst side with several anglers and, and people that know about fly fishing tons. Yeah. Just like you said, we've mentioned earlier, it might, it might as well increase your learning curve like that, like that. That's, That's cool. great. Well, when when did you uh, jump into Cortland? Was it just right after uh, 
you finished college. When was that? I'd say a few years after college, man, I had some pretty rickety jobs there right out of school, just trying to find myself, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Just doing whatever, living at home with my parents and whatnot. And uh, a guy, uh, Joe Goodspeed, actually, who works at Thomas & Thomas right now, I remember I was uh, fresh out of knee surgery, jumping on a boat, going steelhead fishing, and my phone rang at like 6.30 in the morning, and I picked it up. He's like, hey, you want a job? I'm like, yep. He goes, come in tomorrow for an interview. And I mean, within three days, I was started working at Cortland, and uh, that was probably about eight or nine years ago now. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so so it was pretty cool, and Joe and I are still close. And uh, I actually started working in the fly line department at Cortland. I was uh, the fly line mixer for two years. So. Uh, man, I was mixing PVC, lubricant, I mean, you name it, whatever goes into a fly line, I was in there in the department for, for over two years. So I, I have a really good history with how things are made. Um, I was kind of brought up through the ranks from the ground level at Cortland, which uh, honestly, I mean, I, I wouldn't know half what I know now if, if I hadn't started there. So that that's really where it all began about eight or nine years ago and uh, i'm super grateful for that opportunity um it's 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 been crazy it's been awesome and uh it's definitely a very interesting interest uh industry and a process uh not a lot of people are making fly lines over the world and yeah it's, it's definitely incredible to be a part of fantastic and, and having the um humility to step in step in little stones little stones is building your foundation within the, uh the company and in and you know improving your knowledge as you go as you've moved forward that's 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 key for everyone who's young and who wants to join in the, in the industry do that's, you think likewise yeah i mean you I, when when i started i was there for a couple of years you know and i was very into it so i mean i was learning every single day i was picking people's brains that worked in the plan about this fish, that fish. And uh, I remember we had a change in ownership and I had worked my way into kind of a social media role. So I was spending a few hours in fly line, a few hours up in the office doing social media. And man, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what a snook, a redfish, a tarpon was at the time. And I just, I'm like, I got to learn these things. And It, it, it's I've come a long way to be honest with you, but yeah, I mean, I, I really focused on, you know, where those species are, what, what they are, where they're migrating to. I mean, I, I'm obsessed with fishing and fly fishing and, and, and everything about it. So, I mean, it, it, it was, it, it was a crazy learning curve and it was very hard. I mean, you know, social media is tough, man. When, when yeah. I started social media and, I'd post a redfish, I called it a snook, and we'd get blasted, and I was like, hey, man, I'm just, I'm just trying to learn over here. So, you know, I, I, I am very humble, and I'm thankful from, you know, from where I started from and all the way up through the ranks, and I, I tell you what, like I said, I wouldn't be to where I am today if, if I hadn't started down there in, in the manufacturing department. So, uh, as, as you uh, worked in the manufacturing uh, department, Uh, as to the fly lines composition, can you share a little bit? Of course, there's uh, commercial secrets, but can can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the floating line? Let's just start with the floating sure. line. From from what I've know, my very uh, small experience and studies that I've that I did, just reading, reading, trying to understand a little bit better about fly lines. Um, The PVC, uh, from what I've I've read, it has small uh, I can say spheres, but there is there is air on it. Is there or there is not? Yeah. So you, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There, there's an additive that 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 makes that float, and we make both fly lines out of PVC and polyethylene. Um, both fly lines are made from a completely different plastic on a completely different machine. Um, there's, there's a lot of advantages to both. Um, and, and we just, we're lucky that we have both machines and both plastics to work with. Uh, you know, fly lines really started as braided silk back in the day. And you used to have to grease those lines up to make them float. Uh, then the invention of the PVC line, you know, at one point it was just a level line. 
And then we came along with the tapered fly line, you know, both in double taper and weight forward. And that's really where it started, you know, you know, everything. Um, but the plastics use, you know, whether it's a supple yeah. line, hard line, a tropic line, a sinking line, I mean, it can vary. Um, there's so many cool parts of that process. Um, and especially both plastics of the PVC and the polyethylene uh, with, with both systems that we use build those lines it's pretty neat man uh, i'm not gonna lie it's it's definitely uh, a cool place to work and uh things have come a long way since the old braided silk line so um it's nice to be a part of that as we talk about these two main components um is one specific for uh fresh water uh cold water hot water or it's either it's either or both Sure. Can you talk sure. to us a little bit so we can understand a little bit more uh, what is this in reality for us anglers? Yeah, so the, the polyethylene lines, uh, also known as our liquid crystal series lines, uh, poly, polyethylene is really hard in nature as itself, so that's really designated towards your true tropic lines. Uh, PVC, that plastic can vary in terms of its suppleness and its stiffness, uh, and, and we're able to make, you know, some really nice soft, uh, supple lines for cold conditions and right up to the hard stuff for, for your tropic conditions. So, you know, there's definitely a, a little difference in there. And, and that also can be determined by the core that you use. So the braided nylon uh, multi-filament stuff, that, that's really used for your more supple lines. And your monofilament cores are used for your stiffer lines. So there's definitely a difference in there. But polyethylene um, in nature, you know, as just a base material, it's, it's stiffer and it's used for your tropic conditions. I understand that. And as we talk to, uh, uh, let's say, tropic conditions and we have both salt and fresh water, if I choose, for example, let's picture this, this scenario. I'm a beginner to, and I want to buy a better fly line for myself. And, and, and for me, for example, I'm looking at it and as a beginner, it's kind of like a big investment uh, to see as a, you know, the next step. I want a line so I can fish in both environments. Is that possible to acquire a fly line that I can go saltwater? Will it be, uh, are there cons to fishing with it in the freshwater? Is it possible? Can I do that? I understand that there's specific lines for each situation that will fit better. Sure. But... Would that be possible? Yeah, absolutely. As, as long as you're picking a fly line that's rated for the temperature conditions, um, it is possible. You can take a tropic line and fish it. I mean, a lot of the times in, in upstate New York where I live, I mean, man, it was 90 degrees today. I mean, that's about as tropic as it can get. So um, as, as long as you're picking the freshwater or saltwater line where you plan to use it, as long as it's rated for the same conditions as it's meant for, Yes, you can. Now we market things directly towards those anglers. So it's easier for those guys to pick from, you know, if you're striper fishing in the Northeast or if you're tarpon fishing, um, you know, bass fishing, those lines are definitely a little harder than a normal supple line, just because most of the time anglers are targeting bass when it's warmer conditions. So um, there's, there's a crossover for sure. Uh, there's a little learning curve in there as far as how you're going to pick those things. But as long as you're, uh, you know, picking the taper that you want for what it's intended for, meaning, you know, a, a short aggressive taper for bigger flies, the temperature rating is really what you're going to look at. So yeah, you can absolutely take a freshwater line and fish it in saltwater or vice versa, just as long as you're fishing it in, uh, you know, the temperatures that it's rated for. Fantastic. That's, that's a really good insight right there. And, uh, as for collar, uh, picking, uh, not really picking, but are there differences? The scholar influences a lot of the coding as to um, let how I put it this way um, through the guides or, or uh, over a day of period of time, or uh, maybe for fish perception. Uh, is there any any insights about this? The collar of a fly line does influence. Let's take down some myths here and explain a little bit about this yeah. aspect. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, color, you know, one, it's, it's, it's preference. What, the, what the angler can see. I mean, sometimes people are blue, green, colorblind. So blue, green lines just aren't going to cut it. 
Um, another aspect, you know, we make that liquid crystal line in a full clear line. So those lines, while they're great for the angler and great for spooky tar uh, tarpon, bonefish, permit, the guide has a trouble seeing it. So there's a little trade-off there. Um, you know, and the same goes for really pressured trout fishing conditions. Um, you know, a lot of guys like to choose, you know, more of a moss olive colored line because in their back cast, there might be, you know, green leaves or trees and whatnot. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely uh, an, um, specific colors used for specific reasons. Um, some guys, you know, if you like that high viz color because you like to see it, man, that's great. Um, a lot of those guys tend to use a longer leader where their yeah. fly and their leader systems uh, a, a good distance. Just a little glitch there with the connection. On really, yeah, you you got me. I got you back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got you back. Yeah. So we were talking about the longer leader when using a very bright, full colored uh, fly line, such as the high vis. That's great for visibility and you know. Yep. 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 So, like I said, I mean, it's really dependent on the angler, what your targeted species is. Um, you know, like largemouth, smallmouth bass, for example, they're pretty aggressive. They're not very line shy. And you go down in the Florida Keys and start throwing fly lines over a school of tarpon, man, that clear line is just, it's night and day as far as the success that you can have, you know, and, and same thing uh, trout fishing. Um, you know, a lot of those spooky trout that are very pressured, if you can have your fly line blend in kind of to the background mm -hmm. where they don't see false casts, they don't see the casts over their head, it makes a difference 100%, but really depends on the species you're going after, you know, and the angler and, and, and what you can see. Fantastic. Um, as we move to uh, lines that sink in general, let's talk about the, the intermediate fly lines. Uh, from what I know, as the classification of intermediate, is it a line that sinks up uh, up to 1.75 IPS, or is, is it a, a line, a type of line, intermediate line, that uh, any more specifications about what is, in definition, an intermediate fly line? Sure. So yeah. Intermediate fly lines, I mean, you know, years ago, there was kind of one general intermediate kind of sink rate, you know, one and a half, one, 1.75 wow. inches per second. We've really kind of advanced over the years where you can have a, a slow intermediate, a medium intermediate, a fast intermediate, and those get real specific, you know, for certain areas. Um, I mean, still water fishing where there's a fish in a certain water column. And if you don't hit that water column, you're not going to catch anything. So, I mean, intermediates can range, you know, you, you, maybe up to two inches per second, you know, before you bump up into that two to three inch per second time frame um, as far as the sink rate. But, yeah, I, I'd say anywhere from, you know, half inch a second up to two inch per second, that qualifies an intermediate. Uh, we do sell straight intermediate lines as well as slow medium and fast intermediate lines for the still water anglers fantastic so um the intermediate lines in general as we see them they are transparent is that a reason is it the components or is it just a choice to uh kind of let like the fish not see the the fly line that sure. aspect yeah yep. I mean, we make a, a a wide range of intermediate lines um clear intermediate lines, the clear camo intermediate lines, uh, our ice blue intermediate line is somewhat transparent. And then we have some, uh, you know, real opaque intermediate lines with, uh, you know, some, some olive green colors, more natural colors uh, on the surface area. It, it, there, there is a preference there from anglers. Um, it can vary in, in, in water type, whether it's a gin clear water type, maybe a dirty water type, um, you know, whether you're fishing stocked fish in a pond or wild fish in a pond. I mean, it, it really comes down to angler preference, but we can build lines both both ways. Um, I'd say our clear camo is probably one of the more popular lines, even though it is kind of transparent to the eyes, it does really blend in even in clear water. So, um, man, it's, it's angler preference. We build them both yeah. ways. And uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of the, nature, the way the market is right now with, with the way guys want to buy stuff. But we're happy to build them any, any way guys want to guys fish them. 
Fantastic. Uh, and as we talk about these com uh, the components of this these type of lines, uh, intermediate moving on to sinking is just more part particles that are you know compacted into the same uh, coating and thus making it sink faster, or is it a whole different whole different component series of components. Sure. So what we use for the PVC side of things, it's a little less dense of a material. Uh, intermediate lines are a little more dense of a material. Um, those, those things, you know, the components to make a floating fly line, there's an additive in there to make it float where that's not included on the intermediate side of fly lines. Uh, and then when you get down into your type three, type five, type sevens, type eights and what's not, uh, there's an additive to make those sink even more. So, um, it, it's going to vary. Uh, there's there's a, a wide range of plastics, you know, as far as the density goes uh, with that the PVC lines are used for, um, you know, and, and you have additives that make them float. You have additives that make them sink, you know, and the intermediate lines, uh, they have their own dense density of PVC. So uh, that that's for us. It might vary for others, but um, man, there's there's a whole bunch of different stuff. Yeah, yeah, a, a whole bunch of yeah, a whole bunch of particles that you can add into the whole liquid there. Then, then you, you, then you, I believe you, you heat in order to make that shape of a. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So oh. PC is 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 cured over time over the core. Um, that's you know it's a liquid PVC to start, and uh, vice versa on the polyethylene lines. Um, you know, which is, you know, hard to start and liquefied and then cooled. Um, they're two completely different processes, uh, both super cool to, to, to know about and to use. Um, it is a very secret process, uh, yeah. which, which makes it unique. You know, like I said, there's only a handful of people making fly lines in the world. Exactly. It, yep. It's, it's, it's awesome to be a part of. So uh, this nature of the, the PVC uh, as to contrast to polyethylene, uh, specific um, how do I put this in English it's, the name just ran out of me but uh, it's it's it, the variation of which the material uh, grows and 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 you sure. know compacts it differs the taper that's, the taper yeah that's one of the main reasons that you choose between one and and the other yep absolutely while temperature so, range so you know we're, we we make fly lines like I said when things started out long time ago they everything was level and excuse me introduced the uh you know the tapered aspect to everything whether it was a weight forward rocket taper or a double taper uh things have progressed into way more aggressive fly lines um you know for much bigger flies i mean years ago the the, the guys throwing streamers uh the streamer patterns weren't even close to the size of the streamer patterns guys were throwing today and that fly line you know tends to be a little shorter, a little more aggressive, loads the rod up in close much easier than, let's say, a standard weight forward fly line. You know, and then vice versa. When you're throwing small, little size 18s, 20s, dry flies, where you need a delicate presentation, those front tapers on those lines are going to be long and drawn out, so the transfer of energy dissipates over time. So, I you mean... Have a more presentable taper to yeah, address the target absolutely. species with absolutely. a certain type of fly. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, and, and vice versa for the bigger stuff and somewhere in the middle for kind of an all-around line. So uh, it, it tapers are really, you know, built towards what the fly is going to be presented to the fish. You know, uh, you know, short, aggressive tapers for bigger flies. That way they have a lot of energy to turn over a leader in a big fly and vice versa for something small a long front taper to kind of dissipate that energy over time. So, you know, and like I said, somewhere in the middle for, for, for an all around taper. Fantastic. So if I were to pick, um, for example, a fly line for salt water that I'm not going to throw big flies on it. I need a good presentation. For instance, I'm going to bonefish. I'm going, go, I'm going to go fishing for bonefish. The Cortland liquid series, the guide liquid series would be a great, choice because of its big long head sure right? yeah absolutely and, so go ahead and if i were to uh, move a little bit to a little bit more bigger flies that i wanted 
uh, I could go with, for example, the High Viz, you guys just launched. Correct. Which is not such a very long. It's a little bit shorter, but it has a more width, width in it. Sure. And yep. if I would be more aggressive, even a shorter head, maybe the compact guide would be one of the the choices. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, and it can vary. So the 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 liquid crystal guide taper, it it has a long rear taper and a short front taper. So that really helps the long rear taper in carrying line, you know, a change in direction. So when fish are moving in front of you, you can pick up a line at 30, 40 feet, change direction of that fly line. Where you're talking about the high vis flip line uh, has a very short compact taper. That line's really nice for shooting fly line. So the longer rear tapers uh, I like and overall, you know, most like is <clears throat> the ability to carry line and lay it out at a long distance, not necessarily shoot that line 20 to 30 feet. So um, a, lo a lot of what you're going to choose is really based off the front taper. You know, you can manipulate that front taper by building out a longer leader. So, you know, if you end up buying a line with a short, aggressive front taper, and you're like, man, I really got to lay a fly in soft, maybe some shallow bonefish type fishery, you can build out your leader and take that hard energy that's transferred through the fly line and put that into the leader and dissipate some of that energy. So there's, ways, there's ways to manipulate, you know, the fly line that you have um, just because you have one fly line or maybe a couple on the boat doesn't mean that they're only geared towards one thing. Um, if yep. you can read up and, and work on, you know, your leader building system, I mean, you can take a fly line that's short and aggressive or, you know, long and, and, and subtle um, and build it in almost the complete opposite line uh, if you really know how to build, you know, leaders out. But generally speaking, yeah, the long rear tapers, they're great for carrying lines uh, and, and laying them down. And the shorter compact tapers are, they're really nice to shoot fly lines, um, you know, because you get into that running line really quick and that goes through the guides much easier. So there's a variation in there. And like I said, it, you can dictate that and manipulate that, you know, based on the leader that you build off of it. Fantastic. We have one little message here. Uh, why not short head floating clear tip for big flies? Um, is that one of your the Cortland, Cortland lines? The floating short head float? Well, I, I understand that you have the compact, uh, the intermediate one. I've used one of those for saltwater and fished for uh, little tunies. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, special the, the compact intermediate uh, has a 26 foot uh intermediate head we also build some lines called the ghost tips they have five and 15 foot intermediate heads those are really great man uh if, if you like to see that line especially having a floating fly line to be able to recast um full intermediates uh are nice but being able to recast in a short quick situation you know in order to pull out a full intermediate line you know 30 feet under the water it's pretty tough but when you fish those intermediate tips um, that's where it's really, you know, easy to recast. Uh, you can still see your floating line and track it, you know, and current and rips and tides and whatnot. So, um, we make a wide range of the intermediate clear tip lines, uh, you know, and we're working on some of the clear floating tip stuff as well. Fantastic. If you guys have any questions, please send them in for Brooks. We still have, uh, some about half an hour to talk to him because he's in a bit of a tight budget, a uh, tight time there. But we'll cover every single topic that we have here. And so far, so good. Yes. Um, as long as the kids aren't screaming, we can keep going. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so uh, as we're talking about uh, this, this range of fly lines, and one of the main things that uh, anglers come across is uh, the how do I – what do I need to do to clear my fly line? What is the, the – the steps that I should take. Should I uh, use dressing? What type of dressing? Uh, dressing for floating is different from dressing for sinking. Can you talk to us a little bit about that as for yeah, uh, clean, cleaning oh. a fly line after a, a big expedition? And, and when should I be using my dressing? What, what, what should I do? Yeah, so cleaning a fly line is very important, both for shootability and longevity you know, over the lifespan of that fly line. Uh, 
we make a silicone lubricant for all fly lines, whether they're floating, salt water, sinking, and whatnot. Um, cleaning, a salt, cleaning a fly line is, is super important in the salt. Um, if a lot of you guys have been out in the salt on a boat, you get that kind of boat spray and you come back on the water and you're like, man, my stuff's like, I'm sticky. My sunglasses. Sticky. Are sticky. Yeah. It's the same thing that's going to happen to your fly line over time, just fishing it. Um, vice versa in the freshwater. I mean, I've been in scenarios where I've been deep in the Everglades in Florida and the pH levels are super weird and they make a fly line just act completely different than being in clean flesh, freshwater. So uh, what I would recommend as far as cleaning a fly line, whether it's just come out of storage or whether maybe it's just not, you know, shooting right or acting right compared to when you first bought it. Um, I like to do a couple different things. So what I like to do is I'll, I'll take my fly line, I'll get, you know, a nice big bin of clean, fresh water. And what I'll do is I'll dump that whole line in the water. I'll take a nice clean kitchen rag. Don't tell my wife that. And I'll, <laughs> I'll take that rag, you know, anything that's very clean and very dry. Once you get that whole fly line put off into clean water, I'll put, I'll put a good grip on that fly line and I'll reel it back in. That'll take the first kind of load of surface dirt off there. Once that's back on your reel and it's nice and dry, I'll take that same line, I'll dump it off into a, a dry bucket, no water. And then I'll put it back on and I'll put a nice load of the, the silicone lubricant onto a cloth or whatnot. I'll grip that around the fly line and I'll reel that back on. So what happens is a lot of guys will try to clean their line when it's wet and that silicone lubricant, it, it, it doesn't like to bond with that PVC or react right with the PVC. So I'll take kind of a first step and just clean off any dirt, any nicks and grinds with just fresh water and a dry rag. And then I'll take okay. the line, I'll put it into a dry bucket and I'll get the silicone lubricant and I'll put that back onto the fly line. And that dressing is really important. I mean, it keeps line slick, it keeps line fresh. It does seal out dirt over time. Uh, and the most important thing is just the, the whole shootability factor. I mean, that's really why you're buying a quality fly line, um, you know, and that does prolong the longevity and the life of that fly line as well. So, I mean, there's a couple steps, like I said, just getting that initial dirt layer off there with some fresh water. And then once that line's dry, you know, taking that silicone lubricant that we sell as a fly line cleaner and adding that to the fly line, that that's really going to help a lot for a lot of people. Okay. Great, simple, and it will work, right? Um, as for memory, and we talk about, um, well, there, there's that uh, classic twisting of the fly line. You just strip in, and then then you can rotate the rod to sure. rotate. Uh, yeah, but not not that, but the long period of a fly line in the spool, and you're back in fishing after one year for some of anglers, some of the anglers, then you have memory on your fly line. How can we take this out of the equation? If there's the possibility there that we can work on. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe even, even an older fly line that you're, oh, I'm going to this location after four years. Can I use this fly line? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the biggest thing is, you know, when you put your fly line in storage or – Maybe it's a harder line and then you break it out the next day. I mean, there's been times when I've fished uh, warm saltwater conditions where it's 85, 90 degrees one day and then a cold front blows through in the afternoon. You go out the next day and it's 70 degrees. Um, and your tropic line that was fishing great the next day is now used in 15 degree, 20 degree colder air conditions. Um, or, you know, maybe like you said, you haven't been on that bonefish trip in a year, but that fly line was only used for a week the year before. So it should be good to go. And it will be, um, you know, there's a lot of difference in both memory and twist. And the most important thing is that you don't assume what is memory as twist. So a simple stretch is really going to take a lot of the memory out of it. The only problem is, is if you assume something is memory and it's actually twist, when you try to stretch that line, and it's twist, you're almost stretching twist into the fly line. And at that point, you're just going to maintain that coily kind of fly line. So, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, when you first get that fly line that you spool it up properly. A lot of people like to take the coil of the fly line and it comes off like this up to the reel because maybe they're spooling it up at their house. Honestly, I take the fly line coil, I, I wrap it around a couple of kind of 
soft edges of my coffee table to create a little tension there so it's coming off the spool like this you know in a straight line and whatnot it's yeah. hard to see my hands but um you know the, the way you spool a fly line when it's brand new that's very important um how you store that fly line is also very important you know a lot of the times you know you catch a big tarpon or a big bonefish or a big permit and you're reeling that fly line under a lot of tension you take a nice picture and then you go home and you're done for the trip that fly line was loaded back onto the reel under a lot of tension. So a lot of the times what I like to do is strip that thing off, give it a nice little stretch, you know, through the whole thing and lightly put it back on the reel. Um, you know, PVC and polyethylene and other plastics, they'll all kind of act a little different. The biggest thing is, you know, the, the conditions that they're used in and the conditions that they're stored in. Um, PVC will want to relax over time, you know, in warmer conditions. So when you take, you know, a hot fly line and then put it back in the house or you get a cold front, it'll want to retract a little bit and it'll get that memory to it. Um, the biggest thing is just a small stretch. That's the biggest, uh, the, the biggest help you're going to have for a line with memory. Um, you know, there's, there's twist involved in that, like I said, but that can come from different things. The biggest thing I like to do, if you're in a river situation, I'll clip that fly line off. I'll strip the whole fly line out almost to my backing and just let that line kind of untwist in the current. And then I'll basically pinch that fly line and reel it back up onto my reel and it'll slowly take those kind of twists out, you know, and then you're in really good shape. So there's there's a couple different things that go on Fantastic. with line memory, you know, especially when you're fishing a harder fly line um, and you get some varying weather conditions. But I mean, the biggest thing is a, a short little stretch boom, every three feet, four feet. It's not a hard stretch, um, just a, you know, a firm little stretch, and that should take care of most of, the, most of the issues that people might have. Great, great. As you've mentioned earlier, um, as for uh, somebody that's a newcomer or even didn't know and open it, the fly spool and reeled it in like this, introduced a bunch of twists into his fly line. Is the fly line a goner? Or can you just, you can untwist it? What yeah. is the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done it myself. Like I said, I was, I started yep. at some point in fly fishing and I was, I was like, well, I, no one's here in my house. How am I going to spool this up? You know? Yep. You, yep. There you go. Yeah. This, it's this is nice very common. To, yeah. It's nice to have that coil pack. It's got a hole in there. You know, you get a buddy, you stick a pen or a pencil for, they hold it like this and it comes off smooth. That's the correct way to do it. If you got a line machine or a local dealer, obviously that's even better. Um, but if you do do that, um, like I said, I just recommend going out in the yard, trying to cast as much of that fly line out of the rod tip with a leader on, because it'll buckle if you don't have a leader on. And that will eventually, it'll, it will work itself out. Um, if you're in the river and you're like, man, I didn't spool this up correctly. Like I said, dump that whole fly line out, let the current take it downstream it'll slowly work itself out over time. If you pinch that fly line and reel it back on, kind of create that tension. It's not a goner at all. Um, there's, Fantastic. Yeah, you, you can work it out. It might take a little bit. Um, if you just, if you go out in the yard and you false cast, it, it will eventually come out. Um, now bigger flies, some fluffier flies, those will add kind of twist. So clip the fly off, you know, make a bunch there you of- go or you know dump the whole thing in the river and, and let them work themselves out because we got to uh, have the bigger picture here that when you're reeling in the whole fly line 90 feet or what have you uh so many twists that you're incorporating into the system and you got to make all of those go back absolutely yeah and uh you know it, it, it can be affected too you know false casting like I have a funky cast where I come back kind of sideways and over the top, sideways, over the top, you know, and I'm throwing a half twist in there every single time. And, you know, a lot of the times if you don't shoot that full fly line, like let's say, you know, I'm dry flying yeah, yeah. and I'm constantly laying a fly down at like 30, 35 feet, but I got another 10 feet of line kind of at my feet. If you have a funky cast, which most of us do, you know, and a lot of us aren't straight vertical like this. Yeah, and yeah, yeah not even practical uh you're gonna throw a half twist in there and then after 10 15 casts you notice the fish isn't eating your fly so you got to change flies you got a bunch of twists in your fly and you're like man my fly line has memory all it is is just the the, the way just you're twist you know usually what i'll do like i said 
dump that thing downstream, just let it all, I might strip off a little more line, let it work itself out, strip it back in, you know, and re-rig. But, um, you know, if you're able to shoot that full fly line, that twist will come out every time. But if you got a funky little false cast in there, uh, you can kind of add twist if you have some line, you know, five to 10, you know, feet at your, uh, you know, at your waist when you're, when you're waiting, weight fishing. So, I mean, there's a lot of scenarios that, that yeah 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 that's great um uh, as for uh the products that we put on uh, the dressings that we put on uh, our fly lines i have seen some the, the traditional dressing that you use on a fly floating line can you use it on the sinking does it interfere with the sinking rate what should we be uh uh worried about worried about here Yeah, so like the silicone lubricant that we sell, um, it, it is a little water repellent kind of in nature. I mean, silicone is, is going to kind of, you know, it's, it wants to kind of keep water out a little bit, but it's, it's so minute. And um, the silicone lubricant is, is the best thing that you can use for a fly line, whether it's floating, intermediate, or sinking. I mean, you'll, you'll never notice the difference. Um, And it's, it's, it's not going to make a difference um, over time, whether you're using, you know, a type seven, type eight versus a floating line. Uh, we recommend using that silicone lubricant and the fly line cleaner that we sell. Um, it's, it's not going to make a difference uh, overall. Now, I, I, I have heard stories all the time, over time. Like when I first started working at Cortland, I was working in customer service. I still work in customer service. I get questions every day. Hey, I mean, I had this old fly line or like kind of a, meteor ochre fly line i've had it for a few years I, i i put a bunch of soap in a bucket um or, or wd-40 the worst thing that you can do i mean i've never heard a good story where someone said they used dish soap and their fly line worked flawlessly after that usually it's nothing but negatives and uh some some bad stuff happens using dish detergent uh I, i'm not a scientist but maybe it eats away at that pvc they just don't gel mm -hmm. but Yeah, WD-40, dish detergent, things to kind of lube them up that, or, or, or clean them off. Like I said, fresh water and silicone lubricant, those are the only two things you need to, to use to keep a fly line clean and, and to keep it lubricated. Um, okay, okay, that's great. And uh, as for, I uh, heard of some protocols that people heating up the water before putting it to kind of like soak a little bit with detergent so that wouldn't be quite as much as let's just clean off the big dirt that is attached in the yeah. particles if it's fresh water man it can be cold and warm you know it can be hot i highly don't recommend uh putting dish detergent soap in there i've just i've gotten emails and calls over the years not one of them was someone saying man this stuff worked great It's always, my fly line doesn't float after I put dish detergent on there. So, I mean, just from experience, taking those calls and emails over the years, no, I, I'm telling you, man, just, just getting it wet in some fresh water, you know, it kind of loosens up the dirt in the, a little bit and then kind of putting a firm grip with a clean rag over the top when you reel it back in. You'll look at that rag and you'll, you'll realize, man, I didn't realize how much dirt was actually on my fly line, whether it's a white fly line or a black fly line. So, um That, that, those are the only two things I've used, and, and that's what we've suggested to people over the years, and it's worked great. Okay, Cortland, Cortland's protocol. Fantastic. Um, as uh, one question here from uh, shoots from our audience here. Should I be soaking my fly lines in fresh after a day in the surf? Yeah, that absolutely. Like I said, you know, when you're surf fishing, you know, you're out there in that salt water um, like I mentioned before, salt water is just, man, it's, it's weird. You get that boat spray, that stickiness. It's the same thing. Your fly line's in the salt water. That salt's kind of going to grab onto it. I always rinse down my fly reels after fishing in the salt water with fresh water. Do you need to soak them? It can help. Uh, if you take a nice, you know, dense hose with fresh water and really get in there on the reels, um, You're going to want to clean your reels off anyways. I've been with a lot of guides in Florida. Man, we go to the car wash after a day in the salt. We hose the boat down. We hose the rods down. We hose the reels down. Um, if, as long as you're using a hose with fresh water, uh, you don't need to soak them. 
you just got to make sure that they're clean really good, you know, with, with the fresh water. Now, after that's happened and those things are cleaned off, you can dry them out and put a fresh load of lubricant on there and, and they'll, they'll work great the next day. Uh, if they're freshly lubricated, they'll probably last, you know, for, for a while. So you don't have to worry about that. But soaking, hey, you don't need to soak it. Just make sure you got a good, you know, hose down with some fresh water. Fantastic. Um, as for uh, the, the, the other products that we see out there, of course, um, for example, there is a boat uh, thing a product that people use on the boats to protect the boat. Is there a negative aspect as for someone that uses these products on the fly lines? Should they be using the specific uh, silicones to dress use as a dressing for the fly lines? Yeah. What are, I mean, the, what are the things that we should not be applying on our fly lines? That's, that's the main question here. Yeah. Really. Number one or number two is dish soap and WD-40. I mean, that's the easy way out because you probably got it laying around. As greasy as WD-40 feels in your hands, you know, after you spray down nuts and bolts and, and whatever, uh, it, it does not react well with PVC. Um, I definitely recommend using, you know, whatever lubricant that the fly line company that you're, you're purchasing your fly line from recommends, man, run with that. If, if you don't know, buy ours. Um, but no, no dish soap, no WD-40. Um, sunscreen, you know, can, can have an effect in some ways. If, if you're spraying sunscreen on, on a boat, first of all, the guy's probably going to scream at you because his boat's going to be slicker than hell after that. So I don't, <laughs> I don't recommend spraying sunscreen on somebody's nice skiff when you're going tarpon fishing, come, come pre, pre sunscreened up or, uh, you know, use some of that nice lotion sunscreen. So I, I don't, I'm not sure how that, that affects the fly line. Um. Uh, I know I highly wouldn't recommend, you know, testing it out, but yeah, I just, you know, just, just stay with what the fly line brand that you're off, uh, that you're buying recommends. Um, like I said, I mean, ours works great on two different plastics. I'm sure it works, works great on others from some competitors. So just, just stick with those. Don't, don't try to do some home experiment on, on a 90, $100, $130 fly. Yeah and completely regret that decision because uh, you tried to take the easy way out. So, um, you know, just stick with what's recommended. That's, that's my best suggestion. Fantastic. Um, let's move on a little bit. I got the questions, guys. I'm just gonna, just gonna move on to the topics here a little bit and we're, we'll continue to answer your questions within our time schedule. Uh, as for practicing somebody who wants to practice, use his fly line and see, uh, what's going on there with his proper equipment, the fly rod and the, the, how the rod is interacting with the fly line. Um, grass, pools, lagoons. Uh, as for, for example, pools with chlorine, is there a issue here that we should be, uh, Man, uh, not not do not use it on chlorine. Do not use it on pools. I, I wouldn't. Not. I wouldn't recommend it. I've I've never tried that actually. Um, I wish I had a pool in my backyard to be honest. With you. <laughs> yeah, or, me too. <laughs> or or, or some place to throw a fly line in a pool all the time. And there's plenty of water in upstate New York, so we don't have those issues here. But chlorine, man, I I just, I, I wouldn't recommend testing out a fly line of chlorine. I'm sure it's fine if if you were to do that or if you do do that. Like I said, just get that thing stripped off into some fresh water and, and lubricate that thing when, before it goes back on the reel into storage. Now, you, you throw your, your fly line in, in grass or in the parking lot or in dirt, basically anything uh, but fresh or salt water, it's going to get dirty. It's going to get damaged. Um, it's, it's plastic at the end of the day. Um, over time, it's going to get beat up. I mean, we, we do have some some lines that we call seconds that have a slight blemish that we work with shops on and we call them parking lot lines. It's like, Hey, do you want to go out and kind of test the line out a little bit or get used to a line? You know, here's a line with a little blemish. You can blast it all over the parking lot and, and some grass and, you know, throw it out after a couple of weeks when it gets really beat up. So no, I do not recommend, uh, if, if you're not near water and you really want to cast your fly line because it's new or, or you want to practice casting, please don't cast it in the grass. Don't cast it in the parking lot. Don't cast it in dirt. You just, you got to suck it up, go to a park, go to somebody's dock, uh, go to a golf course before you get kicked off and throw it in some fresh water or some salt water, whatever you got to do. Um, chlorine, like I said, 
not sure, don't recommend it. Uh, if you do happen to do it, just make sure you get some fresh water on there from a hose and, and, and clean it off uh, as quickly as you can. Fantastic. Um, just one question related to Cortland's products. What would you say the main differences are between Bonefish Fly Line and the Quick Shooter? Need to buy something for my eight weight. So uh, the Bonefish Fly Line, we don't actually make the Quick Shooter. I know what other brand that, that is. Yeah, but... they have the liquid guide, which sure, is sure. very good. And I've tested and I had a review on my YouTube channel as well. It's a great fly so line. So the, the bonefish fly line that we offer has a long rear taper. And like I said, what's nice about that line is you can carry a lot of line and make more of a subtle presentation to maybe some bonefish in some very shallow water where uh, a quick shooter fly line, you're going to be shooting that fly line to your target. So you don't have as much control with a quick shooter or a short taper. Um, you know, in some instances, that's okay. Maybe it's like schooled up, schooly bonefish in deeper water where they're kind of moving through. They're not really, you know, aware of just very subtle kind of noises, whether it's a push pole, whether it's a boat, uh, whether it's a fly just tapping the water. So the bonefish taper that we offer, like I said, has a very long rear taper. What that allows you to do is carry line to a distance that you want to target uh, and lay down the fly line subtly. So uh, that's kind of the difference between the two, you know, shooting fly line to a distance and carrying fly line to the distance, having control and not having control. So those are the two biggest differences, I think, in, in both of those kind of offerings. Fantastic. Um, Brooks, as for aspiring entrepreneurs in the fly fishing industry, you've mentioned your story and it's a, it's a great, you give, you gave us great insights as how you build up your foundation and how you grow into a big, big company such as Cortland. What would be your advice for uh, someone who's trying to get into the industry, work for a big company, or even be an entrepreneur in the industry? Sure. I mean, the biggest thing, you know, and, and I see it from both ways. I mean, I've always thought like, man, I can do this better or, I could get into that, whether it's fly tying or doing this, or I could start something small and do this better. There's probably 10, 20 other people out there doing it. Um, so my biggest, you know, suggestion is don't get discouraged because uh, you probably can do it better. Um, the biggest thing in fly fishing, you know, the guys getting into it is you just got to stay with it, man. And, and the, the learning curve as far as fly fishing goes, like I will never stop learning. Um, and I, I talk to everyone from, from guides, average customers, you know, our competitors, uh, you know, there's, there's people out there that just, they know so much. Um, just try to talk to everybody that you can, whether it's a dealer, distributor, a fly shop owner, a guide, an angler, a beginning angler, um, whether it's a guided trip. I mean, there's things that I've learned, you know, at Cortland thinking, I know, you know, I mean, I know a bunch now I've been here for years. Then you take out a couple beginners, whether they're your family or friends or whatever, And you're like, wow, this, I really didn't realize this was a struggle for beginners. For, yeah. For different you know, so, uh, perspectives. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm in a small little world at Cortland with, you know, I, I deal with the, the upper tier of anglers, whether they're world traveling anglers or world casting anglers. And then you get down to, you know, your beginner fly angler and there's struggles out there that you just, you never thought of and that you took for granted, you know, just working in the industry because, Like I said before, that learning curve, you just skip it. You know, it's, it's every day you learn stuff that normal people are just, they're doing another job. They're not sitting there focused yep. on fishing, fly fishing knots and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, that's the biggest thing is like, if you're going to get into this industry, don't get discouraged. If there's somebody out there that you're like, man, I had this idea and I, I thought I could do it. There's a couple other guys doing it. Just stay with it. You know what I mean? And, and that's the biggest thing. And eventually you come around and, Honestly, we, we live in a digital world now. So the, my biggest, uh, you know, I don't know what, what the word is here. My biggest suggestion is to, to, to those trying to get into it, market yourself, market yourself better. Um, you know, be, be more responsive, be open to, uh, you know, interaction with customers, um, you know, suggestions and whatnot. And if you're really trying to start something new, You just got to be good at marketing, um, have an honest uh, product, you know, be truthful with your customers and, you know, just, just market yourself better and, and things will work out. 
It's fantastic. You guys do a great job there in Cortland. Appreciate um, it. Yep, yep, you do. Uh, what's your favorite fly fishing event? Is there one that you like to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I so so I've worked at Cortland, you know, like I said, for eight or nine years. I've done little tiny events, shop events, big, you know, IFTD, ICAST. I mean, I've, I've done them all. Um, my favorite event... Um, it's actually the new the, the fly fishing show circuit. Uh, there's a show in New Jersey. Um, why it's my favorite? Well, I'm a Northeast kind of guy, uh, for one. So I, I, I tend to relate to a lot of people, you know, in the waters that they fish. But there's such a diversity of, of anglers there, both men, women, kids. Um, you got saltwater anglers. You have freshwater anglers. You have a, a lot of traveling anglers. Um, you got guys that work on Wall Street. They go over the world. Um, and there's such a, uh, an awesome group of, you know, manufacturers there, competitors there, guys I talk to that are managers, owners, and leaders of other brands that are super cool to talk to. Um, you have the best guides around in that area. Um, that's my most favorite event. Uh, I, I, I mostly like it because I don't have to get on an airplane to go there. Um, <laughs> I pack my truck up and we build the booth out. Um, Fantastic. I see a lot of my friends there, you know, I travel the Northeast so much and I see all those guys there, but the diversity of anglers there, um, you know, there's, there's such a wide range of, of lodges, you know, Belize and, you know, South America and Canada, um, Montana. And I mean, you really get it all wrapped up in that show, a three day show. That that's by far my favorite show. I mean, the food's great in New Jersey. Um, just the camaraderie of the industry is really fun. And I love talking to the customers. Um, a lot of them I can relate to because I fish the waters that their, you know, home water is. And I'm like, hey, you ever been to that bridge? Or, oh, you know, that rock, you know, just around the bend up there. And they're like, oh, yeah, I've been there. Yeah. Try this fly or try that fly line here. And that's what, that's what I like most is being able to relate to the customer at that show. Um, I mean, like I said, I've been to ICAST, IFTD, I've been to big shows, small shows. Um, by far, that's my favorite. Um, I guess I'm a homeboy when it comes to that stuff. But That's that's great stuff. So yeah, the, the fly fishing show is, is from Ben Firminski and his, his father, right? Correct. I, I guided him in the, in the Mambirawa for uh, Arapaima. Yeah, I did. Yeah, He's a I like, great, great those, angler, man. They're, they're, they're great people. Uh, Chuck's a great guy. Ben's a great guy. Their whole family's uh, awesome. I, I love doing business with them. I mean, going to a fly fishing show and, and having a booth there, it doesn't seem like business, but it is business. Sorry, my, my dogs are going crazy. That's all good. Uh, uh, but, yeah, no, they're, they're wonderful to deal with. Um, let me let them outside real quick. Sorry. That's, that's okay. That's okay. Just waiting for uh, Bruce to get back. He's putting his dog out. It's fine. <laughs> We all love dogs. I right. love dogs. My, my, that's, wife, that's... my wife took the kids out for ice cream, and then I, I have two docks and hounds. So when people come home, they, they all of a sudden they act tough. And then uh, <laughs> they, they, they usually ruin babies sleeping or Instagram live videos. So you, you name it, man. They, they got a loud bark, but they're only like six inches tall. So <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. So um, if you were to head back in time uh, – as a fly fisherman, what piece of advice would you give it to yourself? For example, um, as for your learning curve, what would you do if would you would do anything different or even an advice, a suggestion, uh, an insight for someone who wants to begin into the sport? I would say the biggest thing that you need to learn if you're getting in this or if I had to tell myself this 10 years ago. I tell my lot, myself a lot of things 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> but it, it's honestly, it's probably knots. You need to learn to how to tie knots. There's a lot of things, you know, learn how to double haul, learn how to, you know, you know, the equipment you need, you know, what you don't need is honestly the biggest thing. Uh, you know, yeah. I fishing, um, there's a lot of things out there that you just don't need. I, I, over the years, I've become a minimalist when it comes to uh, things that I bring on the water. I mean, I'll spend eight, nine, ten hours on the water, and I, I used to have a pack. Man, I felt like I could stay in the woods for seven days with, <laughs> and it's just completely unnecessary. Um, yeah, 
But I, I think the biggest thing that I would tell myself uh, years ago and, and, and others that are getting into it is, is learning how to tie knots. Um, I, I remember when I first started salmon fishing, um, the nail knot, the connection to the leader of the fly line, man, that was like the biggest hurdle. And I, I know it's the biggest hurdle for people because, um, you know, if, if their welded loop fails or if their fly line doesn't come with loops, they're like, what do I do here? So yeah. Question yeah. every day to this day. And, you know, that was like, that was the biggest hurdle that, that, that I had as an angler. I would go up and, and go salmon fishing and I was going after, you know, 15, 20, 30 pound king salmon. And I'm like, man, if this nail knot breaks, like I'm done, you know? So I would spend, yeah. like, I'm not even kidding you, a half hour, 45 minutes trying to tie a nail knot with a nail back in the day. I have, I had such difficulty back on the days as well so that, that's I, I can relate to that completely and i believe uh, a lot of our, our listeners maybe somebody who's watching us yeah sure uh, it's, it's, you, you it's gotta awful. practice and 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 try and do it and do it and do it until it becomes fluid to you right 100 i mean it, it it becomes almost muscle memory at this point. Again, I mean, I've been doing kind of you know the same stuff over time. I'm still learning new new knots. When I when I go so, yeah. you know, especially on even the conventional side, getting into splicing the hollow core, uh, you know, bimini twists, uh, you know, doing even you know when I got into streamer fishing, doing you know a loop knot, um, you know, stuff like that. But uh, you know, just man, to start like if you don't know knots you know, and your loop to loop connection fails, or if you buy a fly line with, with, with no loop well, the, the loops, well, yeah. on it, you're just like, how am I going to take this line and connect it to this line? And I'm, I've seen the craziest stuff come in. The guys are like, man, my fly line broke or something happened, or I'm going to send it in. And I see these knots. I'm like, Whoa, this, what's going on? There's a whole nother world of people struggling out there. And I mean, even my dad, my dad will go out and he'll give me the rod back the next day. I'm like, what on earth is this connection that you created stream side? So um, the biggest thing I, I would say, you know, both to myself, you know, years ago and people getting into it is learn knots. Um, you know, like I said, man, that connection from leader to fly line. I, I remember the first day, I think I was working at Cortland, somebody showed me the uni knot and the uni knot. Yeah is by far the best damn knot you can know. Uh, you can use a uni knot for backing to your reel, uh, fly line to your backing, fly line to your leader, leader your tippet uh, with a back-to-back -back uni, uh, tippet to your fly line. If you just learn the uni knot and the back-to-back -back uni knot, you will be set up uh, for success. So uh, just understanding knots. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a blood knot a guy when it comes to connecting stuff. But I remember the first time my buddy showed me how to tie the uni knot so a leader to a fly line connection with no you know tool no nail i mean when i mean my head exploded i was like this guy whipped this thing out in 25 seconds he had this thing strong and it was so strong i was like that's the coolest thing i've ever seen and <laughs> i i know to this day that there is a ton of people out there struggling that if their welded loop breaks the fly line doesn't come with a welded loop um that connection is just like, man, how am I going to tackle this? I've seen guys, they double all their fly line and they tie a, a, an overhand knot and they take the loop to loop connection. It works until you have to reel your fly line up into your rod guides and then we get stuck on the tip and then it probably breaks. But um, man, the biggest thing, learning knots, uni knots, back to back, improved clinch, uh, blood knots, loop knots. I mean, there's, you could probably, like I said, just dwindle it down to the uni knot and the back to back uni knot and, and you're good to go for any connection you need in fly fishing. But that was the biggest struggle. And I wish I just, I had some yeah. show me and the day that guy at Cortland showed me that I was just like, you didn't use a nail. You didn't use a tool. You just tied the leader. He's like, yeah, this thing's never going to fail. And I, man, I was, I was like, okay, this is like something I've making the before. world a better place for me. <laughs> yep. 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 And, you know, I don't have to sit around the night before salmon fishing, like rigging my leader to my fly line and scared that it breaks. I mean, I remember getting hung up or like a fish would run through rocks and I'm like, I was wading out in waist deep, fast water. So my fly line and connection didn't break because I was worried I couldn't tie a new one on the side of the bank. So once I learned that, yeah. 
then it was, I was like, okay. And then obviously now that I, I work in customer service a lot with, with customers, it's, it's out there. And I know there's a lot of people watching that are like, yeah, I don't know how to tie that knot. And uh, I, I'm glad I have a loop on my fly line, but it's, it's an important to know as well as, you know, a ton of other knots out there. So that's probably the, the, the number one thing. I know it, it's not exciting, but yeah, I wish I knew knots and I, I hope other people want to learn how to tie them. Just like somebody who wants to uh, play in a new sport, got to go with the basics first. Feel the basics. Absolutely. Fundamentals. Fundamentals. The problem with fly forward. Fi there's a lot of basics in fly fishing. Yeah, we have a lot of basics. There's a lot of basics in fly fishing. That's right. Essentials in casting, knots, learn learning about the fly lines. That's 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 great. Um so as you as you see the big picture of, of catch and release, the sportive industry of fishing and of course fly fishing. Uh, how did that grow in the United States and how how do you see that picture and how do you see it uh, ev evolving through the years, decades and how do you think that can be applied into different countries just, well, you know, on overall to, to this whole thing? You yeah. know, I think the biggest thing is that there's there's an older generation that didn't understand what catch and release was. And part of it was because the population over the last 50 years has absolutely exploded. And I mean, everywhere all over the country. So, you know, where, where it was okay to keep a couple fish, three fish, man, that was fine in, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. But as you add all these people, you know, to, to these areas and they get more pressure, I mean, I'll just talk about trout, for instance. I mean, it's just not a sustainable species to be to, to continue to take from it. You know, I mean, the, the spawning that has to go on, um, yeah. the best rate of that, the pressure that's on there, whether it's a drought or a flood or you know icebergs coming down the river and displacement, and it's all. Over. And I think the biggest thing is that you know right now there's just kind of a, a realization of like man there's a lot of people in this world there's a lot of pressure with the advent of the internet um th th these species just can't sustain themselves no species can um, no species can no the math doesn't close it, it doesn't work when you when you add up the amount of people that that live in some of these areas you know and now you got people flying all over the country you know i mean golden dorado i mean it's blow blowing up you know what i mean with the amount of people that are going down and fishing for them Imagine if you were able to keep those things. I mean, that thing would only sustain yeah. itself for so long, and it's the same same everywhere. So, I, I'm 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 really pumped to see the movement for catch and release. Um, I mean, even my father that got me into fishing. I mean, yeah, we used to keep everything when I was little. Yes, I, me I, too. We're you know? we're same same age. Likewise, I'm I'm 31. We go fishing. No, we're not releasing any fish. We're bringing no. them all home. Yeah. And put them it, in the big freezer. And, and you it, know. It's different now. And I think. It's different. That's I, good. You know, the biggest thing, you know, right now in the Northeast is the striped bass. You know, the, just the, the, the crash of that population. I mean, it has not as much to do with anglers. Probably more to do with commercial fishing than anything. But. Over time, I mean, that there was a moratorium on those fish. You couldn't fish for them. You couldn't commercially fish for them. They came back, they blew up, and we're like right back in the same place that we were in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm really stoked to see the movement for uh, catch and release. I mean, even here in New York State, I mean, the movement to keep daily fish count limits, you know, down to one as opposed to five, um, you know, that, that stuff's great. And it's just going to yeah. happen. Um, I mean, the biggest thing is you have to know what you're fishing for. You have to know what you're keeping. I mean, there's game fish, you know, perch and walleye and whatnot. And then there's fish yeah. that, that, that are stocked. I mean, if you have a stocked river or a stocked lake or a fish hatchery, those are built for you to keep fish. People want to keep fish. I eat fish. I keep some fish all the time. But there's certain fish that you just don't keep. Um, yeah. and, and, and unfortunately you have to be somewhat educated on to what those fish are. Um, you got to understand what you're doing to that population. You know, can that thing sustain itself? Okay. The regulations say I can keep five. Should I really be keeping five? Um, I'm hoping over time, you know, like I said, that older generation will slowly fade away. Uh, they're not fishing as much. 
Uh, it's sad to say I had to educate my old man on a lot of stuff. I'm like, yo, we, just, we, we can't be keeping five brook trout every single day we're going to these streams, you know. And, uh, you know, the, I think the number one thing, I, 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 I'm a big deer hunter, and there's a reason why you only get one or two or three deer tags a year. Because if we had deer farms and we were stocking deer in the woods, it would seem kind of stupid, wouldn't it? Uh, it just wouldn't make sense to continue to stock deer for people to go hunt deer. So exactly. it, there's a reason for tags. And I know in some Atlantic, San, Atlantic salmon fisheries, there's tags for those fish because they want you to only keep a certain amount. So I'm just stoked to, to, to understand that this whole movement, you know, especially in New York State, uh, that, that's changed considerably this year. Uh, and, and all over the country, every species, Bonefish Tarpon Trust does an incredible job. I mean, man, when I first started, like, you could keep tarpon. You could keep a tarpon. And now it's the only way you can keep a tarpon or even pull one out of the water is with a world record tag. And, and that's fine. But uh, you're talking, you know, a, a minimal amount of fish. But, um, man, you know, just not being able to hoist those giant fish out of the water or keep those yeah. I mean, look at some of the legends back in the day. And I mean, even those guys are embarrassed. I mean, some of them aren't around anymore, but, you know, hanging a giant tarpon up from a tree and a gaff, like those guys are embarrassed right now that they were doing that, but they didn't know. And now they didn't know any better. Yeah. 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 That was the reality. That was, yeah. Yeah. You go from 5 million people who live in Florida now to 25 million people that live in the Florida and, and they're all fishing for the same thing. Listen, things progress, things change over time. I'm, I'm pumped to see yeah. a, a massive movement in the fly fishing industry, uh, industries overall towards catch and release fishing. I mean, it's it's great, man. And, and it's only going to help people get into this sport more. If we didn't have these movements, you know, the people that want to get in the fisheries or, or trout fishing, they're like, what am I fishing for? There's not as many yeah. fish. So. I, I love it. I'm, I'm glad that everyone's getting on board. It was a difficult conversation to have the last 10 years, 20 years, but there, it's, a, it's a strong movement. It's the correct movement. Um, at the end of the day, there's too many damn people in this world. Everyone wants to fish, and a lot of those species just aren't sustainable. So um, it, it's, it's great to see, and, and I hope it continues. Fantastic. Uh, Brooks, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, having some of your time uh, thank tonight you. Thank you for having me, man. to share to sh yeah yeah to share your knowledge with us thank you very much uh do you have any more messages uh for our listeners before we wrap up uh man the only you know message i have if you know if you have questions for courtland uh shoot us an email at info at courtlandline.com check us out at courtlandline.com uh we got an incredible crew of people that work at courtland both in the manufacturing plant, up in the office, customer service, you know, sales reps. Uh, we, we got an awesome team. Like I said, I started in manufacturing, you know, and I sit there every day. I answer phones. I answer emails. I mean, I see a lot of the stuff that comes in. We, we got an incredible team. And, man, if you need to learn how to connect your leader to your fly line, shoot us an email, and, and, and I'll go over what you need to do. And that's the best part about Cortland is uh, – we're a small made in America team. Um, we got a lot of fishy people on our, on our program. Everyone's just well versed in, you know, conventional fly fishing, you know, trout fishing, saltwater, you name it. Um, there's, there's not a question you have that we can't answer. And that's my biggest thing, you know, why I wanted to come on here tonight is just, you know, open people up into Cortland line and just let them know that we're always available. We're, we're not a large corporation where you're getting some robot answering your phone calls. Just give us a shout. Send us an email. Shoot us a message on Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're going to get back to you. We're going to get back to you with the right answer. We'll pick up your phone calls. Um, we got a great crew, and it, it's a special team at Cortland, and uh, it's a lot of fun to work there. I mean, like I said, I'm just super lucky. I was born in Cortland. I was raised 10 minutes up the road. I'm a half hour away from work every day. Um, I'm probably the luckiest, luckiest guy in the world when it comes to being a fisherman, working for a fishing company, and uh, there's not a day I don't take for granted. So, um, man, I'm, I'm happy to help anybody that has questions, and uh, give us a shout. We're, we're here to help. Thank you very much. Thanks again for coming. Share your knowledge with us, buddy. Thanks, and Appreciate it. Yeah. Good night. Have a good night. Good night.